Hello, hello, my name is Dr. Brian Curtis, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist out of fossil crates. And I'm here today to talk about mummies. It's Halloween time when I'm recording this, a few days away from a great Halloween. And this paper drops on Edmontosaurus enectans, arguably, specimens. So your classic duck-billed dinosaur 66 million years ago in Wyoming, in the late Cretaceous there are some of the most incredible mummy dinosaurs ever discovered. And in particular, the Edmontosaurus specimens that they found on this particular paper are about, which is Ed Senior, what they call an early adult. It's specimen UCRC, space VP, 30, and Ed Junior, which is specimen 31. And it is an early juvenile, probably the smallest mummy ever discovered. And we can look at the figures that they provide here, and you can see that the Ed Senior VP30 is the back half of an adult. And it has incredible amounts of specimen that is preserved, including the tail that goes on. I think it's probably the most mummified tail around. Their big takeaway message for everyone is stop drawing spikes forward of the middle of the hips. That came across loud and clear. And the reason is, on the specimens that they found, as well as when they reviewed other specimens, they didn't find any spikes forward of the hips on the Edmontosaurus. Edmontosaurus has spikes. They start off small in the middle of the hips, and they go backwards down the tail until around the 20th caudal vertebra, where they get to be their tallest, about two inches. I love tails. Shockingly to me, every one of the spikes corresponded to a caudal vertebra. And the, they all have these very tall spines on hadrosaurs and the skeleton of the tail. And the neural spines actually bolt into these tail spikes. And the tail spikes do something called interdigitate. They interlock. Each one's base is bifurcated. So it splits in. So you have this beautiful, cool line of spikes down the tail, one for each tail bone underneath. So it ties to the body segments. And that's cool because body segments in lizards today, for the most part, do not correspond with the spikes above them. They have midline spikes, but they're not tied to the bones underneath, except in a few places. Trioceros has a one-to-one -one ratio of spike to vertebra, as does Sphenodon, the tuatara in the tail. Very cool to see. They go on to point out that on this particular one, Ed Senior, it has a hind foot hoof. And they define what is a hoof, and they show great imagery of a hoof. And they did a lot of work to show that these hooves are absolutely spectacular. They have the Junior, which is Ed Junior, short for Montasaurus, I'm assuming. And it's missing its limbs, but it has the trunk, the body section, and it's included in there. It has part of the back of the, towards the hips, but there's no spikes. And there's no spikes on senior as well, forward of the hips, and there are zero spikes on the juvenile at all. And they believe that this is not because it was a young animal. Uh, they don't believe the spikes were present at all forward of the hips, period. So if you're drawing it in Montasaurus and you're putting spikes forward of the hips, they would argue to stop. Now, they found fleshy crests that run from the back of the skull all the way down to the hips, and those crest and the adult get very tall. They start off fairly small, inch or two, and they grow and grow and towards the middle of the back where they're almost 17 or 11, 12 inches tall in the early adult. That's a tall, fleshy area. There's no sign of any spikes in this area whatsoever. It's just fleshy. And the flesh is thin, the thin flesh all over these hadrosaurs. I find it interesting their artwork of their Ed Senior, it puts the little fleshy cap that Edmontosaurus regalis is known for on the back of it. But in their text, they don't believe that cap would have been present because the neck flesh of regalis versus anectins is such that the anectins neck flesh would have subsumed that cap and it wouldn't have been present, at least according to their words. But their illustration, they even note, they kind of wishy-wash that they added it on there. But it certainly looks cool, and it definitely appear, appears to be a legit feature on the Edmontosaurus regalis, which I was always doubtful of. Now, getting into the hooves is kind of cool because they have little tiny one millimeter scales on the phalanx, 
and there's tiny scales all over the feet, unlike birds where they have these big scales right near the foot. And these scales move over to the bottom of the feet and they find these blades, these ungules, and it was always thought that the nail was just a little bit thicker. But what we they, they were able to show is that it's twice the length is this big hoof and it's three toed. They make a very distinct track on their on their hind feet and they were able to match it back with tracks to show that, yes, indeed, the hadrosaur tracks and the hadrosaur feet with all these mummified feet, they can even tell the angle that the foot is pushing in and pulling off. This is going to open up a lot more biomechanical constraints. Super awesome. Uh, one of the other items that it shows is that on these hooves, it's the oldest hoof, it's the only hoofed reptile. It's the oldest occurrence of hooves which is kind of cool. I've never really thought about when hooves appear, but they're always in mammals. It's the first time a bipedal capable animal has hooves. Also, it's the first animal where the hind foot and the forefoot work differently when they push into the ground. So the famous mummy that everyone knows is AMH and h Farb 5060, and that was bought by the American Museum from Charles Sternberg in 1908. Unfortunately, most of the skin was lost during collecting. There was a crest over the middle of the neck, and we know that because the head was bent back, and so that section was preserved and they weren't able to remove it. And Osborne knew, or he strongly suspected, it had a midline flesh and crest that went down, and he drew it as such, or he had uh, Charles Knight draw it as such on these images that they provide. 5730, is a specimen that was, and I quote, surrounded by a natural cast of its epidermal impressions. But it was found in 1884 and they prepared all the skin off, unfortunately. That specimen must have been spectacular. And then if you fast forward to MOR V007, uh, in the 80s, Jack Horner published on this and he saw there was a, a spikes above on the tail side and seemingly a one-to-one -one match. So we're learning about Edmontosaurus through time. Other hadrosaurs include Corythosaurus, which is on display in the American Museum, and it's the specimen 5240. And unfortunately there, Brown said it had a median fold of skin. And Lull and Wright in 1942 even noted that the crest is deepest over the hips. But they drew the crest running up and down over the trunk. They, they went against what they saw and their artists drew this big giant crest on the back. They talk about Gryposaurus, ROM 764. And that one has a pair of spikes preserved. Here's an image of one. And Lowell and Wright, even though they saw this, they had their artists restore it with a solid crest across the body. It's unfortunate, but that's what they did but they knew it had spikes and it's right over the hips. And in none of these animals was there any indication of dorsal spines forward of the hips. Now, Bell and crew in 2014 published the fleshy cranial comb on the head on Edmontosaurus regalis. They point out that Campione and crew in 2015, though they cited it as 1915, published an Edmontosaurus regalis drawing with spikes across the back forward of the hips. And they don't think that's appropriate or accurate at all. And they point out that Drumheller et al. 2022 do the same thing with their Edmontosaurus specimen, which I saw as Spa and I've seen it as Regalis. I don't know what species it is. I don't know if anyone knows. They have the spikes over the tail and in the hips. They don't have any preserved forward, but they illustrate going all the way to the neck. And Serino and crew would say that's wrong. Don't do that. They even write, we have found have not found clear evidence for spikes anterior to the hips. Points out that Bell 2012 has midline spikes forward of the hips and says, don't do that. That's not appropriate. And Bertozo at all 2017 have presacral spikes. And they argue that on that one with Gryposaurus, there's no presacral spikes. Uh, but he also says that on Gryposaurus at least, the spikes don't likely correspond in a one-to-one -one ratio to the tail. They are separate across. Regarding the hoof, they say the closest modern analog is the taper. I love tapers. They're so adorable. If you ever get time to just watch tapers, do it. They're fun to observe. 
watch them all over the world and they're just super cool to see in zoos. Haven't seen them in a while yet, someday. But the taper has three toes. It has the sub grade hind feet and it has hooves and it's got three distinct hooves, very similar. The tracks look similar in the three toes. So the taper is the animal that is most like duckbill dinosaurs when it comes to tracks, which is fascinating to me. They talk about 20 large body non-avian dinosaurs with substantial integument renderings. However, when I counted, I found 22 specimens listed and they listed concavenator, which surprised me. I just saw that a few months ago and it's got tiny bits of skin. I would not say substantial integument renderings, but I can tell you that the mummy paper itself was fun to read, especially thinking about how a taper is the closest footprint to a mummy. So interesting paper, had a lot of fun. I'm curious to see what the world comes back and uh, how it's received overall.